Good morning. We start this morning with general questions. Question number one from Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it will provide to the proposed Ayrshire Growth Deal. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, as I made very clear to the three Ayrshire Council leaders when I met them on the 8th of March, I am fully committed to finding ways to support regional economies to thrive in Scotland. Uh, together with Scottish Futures Trust and my officials, they are continuing to refine their growth deal proposals. I'm very impressed by the collaborative approach, three councils working together, and they have been chosen to be a pathfinder for the regional partnership strand of the Enterprise and Skills Review. While this work is underway, we have continued to invest in Ayrshire, and just last month, North Ayrshire was selected for one of the two remaining TIF pilots in a project which will directly benefit the growth deal aspirations. Brian Whittle. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, Jamie Green, John Scott and I recently met with Greg Clark, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and also arranged a meeting between the Secretary and the Ayrshire Growth Deal team to establish how the Ayrshire Growth Deal fitted in with the new industrial strategy framework. It was a very positive meeting, but as the Minister will know, the timeline, uh, timeline starts by initially aligning local government and private enterprise funding, then get a commitment from the Scottish Government on what projects they will support and the level of funding they are prepared to invest prior to the UK Government looking at any shortfall. This will be an ongoing, project, uh, ongoing process as many projects come online. With that in mind, can the Minister tell Parliament if the Scottish Government has done, done this assessment and quantify what they mean by the commitment to the support of the Ayrshire Growth Deal? Cabinet Secretary. I, I would say to the member that the process that we follow is similar to the city deal process, whereby we take the proposals which come from, in this case, uh, the local councils and their partners, and we analyse those and see which ones are best able to uh, be susceptible to support, which will help generate economic growth in the area. So we're going through that process, and the councils are well aware of that process. Uh, we've made that uh, point clear to them. I've also said to, in my own meeting with uh, Greg Clark, that what we'd like to see is the UK government, having moved away from the city deal uh, model uh, once all the cities in Scotland have been um, uh, uh, through that process, to now talking about the industrial strategy might be the means by which additional support might be uh, provided in this case. Now, if that is the case, it's much better, and I said this to Greg Clark, that we work together on that to maximise the benefit. We did ask and have asked a number of times for the UK Government to be part of the Asia Growth Deal, as the three local authorities uh, have done. They refused to do that, but it is still possible that through the industrial strategy we could work together, and I would encourage the UK Government to do that. In the meantime, we will continue to process the proposals that we have received from the Growth Deal partners. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On 10th of February, I submitted a motion for members' business on the Ayrshire Growth Deal. Non-partisan, it even said, and I quote, the UK Government has displayed an encouraging attitude and expressed its support for the initiative so far, after Patricia Gibson MP led a Commons debate on the deal on 19th of January. She then wrote to all Ayrshire Tory MSPs, calling on them to lobby the Chancellor to back the deal, which all three Ayrshire councils and the SNP Government support. None gave her the courtesy of a reply. Does, it, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that it is disappointing at best that not a single uh, Tory or other opposition MSP supported a debate on the Ayrshire Growth Deal in this chamber, and nor did the Chancellor even mention it in his budget speech despite heavy hints, let alone allocate a single penny of the £359.8 million required to generate and stimulate the real and lasting economic growth that Ayrshire so badly needs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I can say to the member, from my point of view, I have consistently expressed my desire to take forward discussions with the UK government to support this deal. I've done that, I think, both in writing and face-to-face -face with the UK government. And it's unfortunate that we've not had that explicit support from the UK government to the growth deal itself, along the lines of the city deals which we've worked together on in the past. Um, I am still um, hopeful, though, that we can have some involvement by the UK government, including possibly uh, financial assistance to some of the ambitions of the growth deal. Uh, Derek Mackay wrote to the Chancellor ahead of his recent budget to ask him to join us in tripartite discussions, but the UK government failed to make that commitment. The Scottish government, though, continues to support the progress of the Ayrshire growth deal, as I've mentioned, to determine priorities, timeline and next steps. As I say, I've recently discussed support for the Ayrshires with Greg Clark when I met him earlier this month, and I'll continue to push the UK Government on this matter, as I'm sure the Member will as well. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government how it is assisting local authorities to provide welfare support advice. Minister Jean Freeman. Local authorities have statutory duties to fulfil in the provision of advice support in a number of areas. In total, the Scottish Government will spend around £21 million on advice-related projects in 2017-18. Of this, 
thousand will be provided to local authorities through the Scottish Legal Aid Board funding programmes to provide su support advice provision for people affected by debt and the UK government's welfare cuts. Since 2013, the Scottish Government has provided some £6.85 million to Citizens Advice Scotland for the provision of welfare advice across its network of 61 bureaus in 30 local authority areas. Additionally, we estimate that around £5.6 million of funding for local authority financial inclusion related projects will be provided between April 2015 and June 2019 through the European Social Fund to support people affected by poverty and social isolation. In 2017-18, we are providing local government with a total funding package amounting to more than 10 billion, and many councils are utilising this, in addition to what I've already said, to both fulfil a range of statutory duties to provide advice and provide additional welfare support too. <clears throat> Presenting officer, like the minister, I oppose Tory welfare cuts. But it appears the Scottish Government is happier to court grievance, ferment anger and wave flags than actually get on the, with the job of governing. We already know that the Government's recent benefits update campaign lasted just a week and had a budget of just £6,000. And now the Minister has shamefully decided to cut £600,000 of funding to welfare support and advice services in Glasgow alone. A decision the Tories would be proud of. How can the Minister justify this shameful attack on the most vulnerable in our communities? Minister. Well, Presiding Officer, I think we knew that one was coming. It is a matter of some regret. It is a matter of some regret. If members would not shout at me, but let me speak, it is a matter of some regret that political point scoring yet again is at the forefront of Labour's mind rather than looking at the detail of what this government is doing to support individuals across Scotland who are facing the damaging austerity cuts imposed by the UK government. Misinformation and misrepresentation of the facts serves our constituents and the people of Scotland poorly. And I countenance Labour to think again about that matter. What we have done is prioritise our use of the available funding to those areas most in need, including those most affected by the rollout of universal credit. And it is wrong to suggest that this government is not funding advice and support services in Glasgow, because we are, as we are across constituencies in Scotland. And finally, can I say, if the member had did, done me the courtesy of listening to what I said previously in this chamber about the benefit take-up campaign, he would understand that along with Citizens Advice Bureau, we jointly agreed on that first stage and that more of that work will come forward over the next four years. Can I say a great deal more than Labour ever did when they were the Scottish Government? Question three, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what benefits the Glasgow City deal will bring to Motherwell and Wishaw. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government is a full partner in the Glasgow City Region deal, which is now in its delivery stage and is contributing up to £500 million over 20 years into the £1.13 billion Glasgow City Region deal infrastructure fund. The deal empowers Glasgow and its city region partners, including North Lanarkshire Council, to identify, manage and deliver a programme of investment in infrastructure. Three core North Lanarkshire projects have been identified by the Glasgow regional partners for delivery within the first 10 years of the deal, accounting for a total capital investment of around £170 million. These projects include potential investment in strategic roads infrastructure to improve access between Motherwell and the M74 and to improve road and pedestrian links within Motherwell Town Centre. Claire Adamson. The Ravenscraig site in my constituency has been a national priority since 2013. Can I have the insurance of the Cabinet Secretary that when capital expenditure is being considered across portfolio areas, that the unique opportunities that this Brownfield site has in relation to infrastructure, central belt location and land be considered to ensure that further regeneration of the site can be achieved? 
Cabinet Secretary. Well, just first of all to reiterate to the member that in relation to the Glasgow City Region deal, that it's up to the partners to prioritise the projects, of course, which have been supported by both ourselves and the UK Government. But the Scottish Government remains committed to working with North Lanarkshire Council and other parties on options for the further redevelopment of the Ravenscraig site. Over £45 million has been invested to date in remediating the site and delivering a first phase of development. Market conditions, though, as a member knows, have rendered it impossible to deliver the proposed Phase 2 of the Ravenscraig Limited Master Plan. That's why in August 2016, Scottish Enterprise approved a contribution of up to £415,000 to part fund the development of a new master plan, which will in turn enable Ravenscraig Limited to identify a realistic deliverable Phase 2. A draft of the new master plan is due, to, due in late spring, early summer this year. Graeme Simpson. There have been cross-party concerns over some of the projects in the Glasgow City deal. Road schemes in particular have been plucked off dusty shelves, having lain there sometimes for decades, dusted off and thrown into the mix on the back of business cases which frankly don't stack up. Holy Town Link Road in North Lanarkshire and Stuartfield Way in East Kilbride are just two for which there is little to no justification. Claire Adamson is right to point out that Ravenscraig would be a useful area for city deal money to be spent, but as far as I can see, there's nothing planned there. Such are the concerns that the Local Government and Communities Committee will be doing its own inquiry into city deals. So does the Minister agree with me that the Glasgow city deal should be refreshed in order to deliver the economic growth across the region that it was... Cabinet Secretary. Can I say that um, I, I would not want certainly to rule out uh, looking afresh at these things, but I do uh, point to the fact that the basis of the city deal includes an assurance framework which both the UK government and Scottish governments have signed up to. If there is dissatisfaction in terms of the assurance framework, then it might be uh, that the member would want to take that up with the UK government to see if they share that dissatisfaction. I have not had that feedback from the UK government as things stand. But it is the case that perhaps the new local authority elections provide us with the opportunity uh, to look afresh at these things as to whether projects were taken off dusty shelves. The projects that were put forward were those put forward by the local authorities themselves and we agreed to support them. They are the ones that chose the priorities and we have backed them up in that choice. Question number four, Neil Findlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many women in Scotland have been implanted with transvaginal mesh since 2007? Minister Maureen Watt. 13,665 women in Scotland have been implanted with transvaginal mesh since 2007. Neil Finlay. The Minister will be aware of the devastation felt by Scottish mesh survivors who feel the review into the use of mesh was a whitewash. Uh, if the government is confident it is not a whitewash, when will they bring forward a debate on this very important issue to the women and men of Scotland? Minister. Well, as um, Neil Finlay knows, uh, this, uh, the Chamber had the opportunity to question the Cabinet Secretary when she came with a statement to Parliament on the 30th of March. The Cabinet Secretary is also due uh, to appear in front of uh, the Petitions Committee. And I think that once that uh, has taken its course, if a debate is required, then the uh, we are, Ministers are happy to agree. Question number five, Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action has been taken to preserve green spaces. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Scottish planning policy requires local development plans to identify and protect open spaces that have been identified as valued and functional. The National Planning Framework aims to significantly enhance green networks, particularly in and around our towns and cities. Sandra Boyd. I thank the Minister for that reply and uh, in my own constituents of Glasgow Kelvin, North Kelvin Meadows, a green space owned by Glasgow City Council was saved after the local community came together to oppose a planning application from a developer and subsequently called in by the Scottish Government. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise uh, what the Scottish Government can offer in further support uh, to communities campaigning to save green spaces such as uh, Kelvin Meadows and others and how this support is communicated communicated sorry, to these local communities. Minister. Um, I know that Sandra White has been a, a very keen campaigner uh, on the issue of North Kelvin Meadows. Uh, so let me assure her that the Scottish Government have taken action to support green space. 
I understand that uh, North Kelvin Meadow is owned by Glasgow City Council. Uh, so thanks to our Community Empowerment Act, uh, there is a right for community bodies to make requests to local authorities for any land that they feel that they could make better use of uh, through the asset transfer process. So that may be a, an option there. Asset transfer, of course, will give more communities uh, the opportunity to have control of land or premises to help them develop their own economies and environments. Any community body interested in using asset transfer to pre preserve green space in their area should get in touch with the Community Ownership Support Service, which is a programme funded by the government to help community groups take on land or building assets for their communities. Question number six, John Lamond. Uh, thank you, Presiding officer, officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in closing the attainment gap in the Scottish borders. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government, through the Scottish Attainment Challenge, is providing increased support for local authorities, including Scottish borders, with their work to close the poverty-related attainment gap. The Scottish borders have received over £315,000 from the Attainment Scotland Fund over the course of the last two years and will receive £1.8 million of pupil equity funding in 2017-18. Head teachers will have the flexibility to target resources at interventions they know will help close the attainment gap, and they are currently preparing their plans for use of this funding. John Lamond. Uh, well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply, but the attainment gap in the borders remains one of the worst in Scotland. Indeed, the SNP's record on education in the borders over the last 10 years is not good. Class sizes are, are, are at a record high as teacher numbers have dropped by nearly 80. The number of supply teachers have plummeted by 40 per cent. Only one in 10 primary one to three pupils are in smaller classes, a record low despite this being an SNP election pledge. And the standard of education across Scotland, which used to be a le world leading, is now only average. Teachers work incredibly hard on the Scottish borders, but they and pupils are being let down by this SNP government. Is this a record the Cabinet Secretary is proud of? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we know the cheerful, optimistic tone that John Lamont's going to be taking to the doors of the borders over the course of the next few weeks. I was going to be generous to Mr Lamont to say to him that it's, I know that he's going to be leaving us tomorrow, but on the basis of the miserable tone that he's expressed, he, doesn't, he can't realise the significant investment that's been made in the borders, and I look forward to making sure that the young people and the electors of the borders understand the strenuous efforts this government is going to make to close the attainment gap in the borders, and I look forward to Mr Lamont uh, being a distant observer of that process. Question number seven, Jackson Carlo. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Welsh Government regarding organ donation since the Human Transplantation Wales Act 2013 came into full effect in December 2015. Minister Maureen Wood. Scottish Government officials have been in regular contact with Welsh colleagues since the introduction of the Human Transplantation Wales Act and are due to meet soon to discuss the operation of the Act. Additionally, the opt-out system in Wales is discussed at regular meetings on organ donation, such as NHS Blood and Transport Board meetings and taking organ, organ transplantation to 2020 strategy meetings, where all four governments of the UK are represented. Uh, Scottish Conservatives uh, supported the Scottish Government during the progress of Anne MacTaggart's bill, when the Government took the view that we should wait to see what the experience in Wales was. The government at that time undertook early in this parliament to bring forward fresh proposals in the light of that. We're now almost 18 months since the introduction of the uh, change in Wales. Can I ask the minister when that early introduction of new fresh Scottish government proposals will come? Minister. Uh, well, as Jackson Carlow knows, the, uh, the Scottish government has recently uh, gone out to consultation, including a presumption in favour of moving to an opt-out uh, system, assuming it can be introduced safely. The consultation responses are currently being independently analysed, and we will learn from that analysis, as well as from the experience, experiences and evidence from elsewhere in the world, including Wales. And we'll, 
look at that analysis carefully before reaching a decision on the way forward. So we expect to receive the analysis in May and we'll take steps in the months thereafter.